Can you imagine you buy... We're in Whistler, BC, testing five of the latest trail bikes, most of which cost somewhere between a duffel bag and a wheelbarrow full of money, except for one. Norco's aluminum-framed Fluid FSA1 retails for $3,999 American, which is less than half of our other bikes. So why is it here? Well, bikes can be really, really expensive, but we wanted to know what the differences are out on the trail during our back-to-back -back testing. The new Fluid has 130 millimeters of rear wheel travel and 140 millimeter fork, and it also gets Norco's ride line geometry that sees a roomy front end, 65 degree head angle, and size specific seat angles and rear end lengths. The aluminum frame means that Norco had room to spec a mostly Shimano XT drivetrain, along with a set of impressive TRP brakes and Stan's aluminum rims. How does the $4,000 fluid compare to carbon bikes costing a whole bunch more? Let's find out next. All right, Kaz, we've already talked about how this is the least expensive of all of the trail bikes we have here. Do you think that hurt it when it comes to climbing? I mean, if you're someone that counts grams, it is also the heaviest bike here. Yeah. But you kind of just get used to it. It's not overly heavy, I wouldn't say, for what it is. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's like a pound or two heavier than the other bikes. Yeah. But this is a $4,000 American bike. Some of these other bikes, their frames cost more than this thing. Yeah. And this was a neat experiment for us and maybe for you guys too, to, to see it, this bike here and how it compares to these more expensive bikes. So. Let's start talking about that and let's start talking about climbing first. I think this is a fairly active bike and there are pros and cons to this. Tell me what you think and what you like about it. Yeah, you? I found the same, it's pretty active. You know, if you are uh, standing up out of the saddle and pedaling, you do notice it moving a bit more than some of these other bikes that stay a little bit calmer. Um, you can dial the compression lever on the shock if you want to move that and it also has a climb switch. And I did use the climb switch a little bit. Most of the other bikes we have here are just- You never say that. Yeah, it's true. I don't usually use a climb switch, but here there were some kind of steeper road climbs. Yeah. Just flip the switch. And then it's not a full lockout on this. It does still let it move a bit. So if yeah. you get some rough stuff, you don't feel like you're getting bashed around. Yeah, I was behind you. So we were going up a, a fairly smooth climb to access a trail. And I was behind you and I could just see it just, just cycling mm -hmm. like this, which I don't really think it it really hurts the bike's performance. The upside, of course, it has a ton of traction and you could just use the climb switch like Kaz did, but it's worth noting that, I mean, some people will want to use it. I think if you used it, I think some people will want to use it. Yeah, exactly. And also we are talking about a 130 mil travel bike where we cut the bigger, longer travel bikes a little more slack, but this is a fairly short travel trail bike. So you kind of want, people that want that more efficient, snappy feel, then we're not going to find it for this. Yeah. But. You know what's funny though, Kaz? Like I've known, this whole time that the bike is more active than the other bike. So I've had this Norco at home and I have put a ton of miles on it and I almost never lock it out. And it's, it's funny, like I know it's not as efficient as some of these lighter, way more expensive bikes, but I'm just as happy to do big pedals on it. Like just get on it and go. Yeah. I think a lot of that has to do with the geometry. I think yeah. Norco over the last few years have done a really good job sorting out the geometry of their bikes. And that carries over with this one as well. You got that nice upright riding position. Um, and they did a good job too with the stack height of the bike. So what that does kind of raises the front end and it makes it feel really similar to all the other bikes we have on test, even though it has a shorter travel fork. Exactly, that's exactly what I was gonna say. 140 front end, that head tube length and the stack height, all that stuff, that's really important. If you're trying to ride a 140, a bike with a 140 fork as fast as a bike with a 160 fork, like mm -hmm. some of these other things have. Yeah, you don't wanna feel like you're all hunched over in kind of the old school cross country position. You know, a lot of us have gotten used to and come to appreciate that more upright riding position. And this bike has that. Yeah. So yeah, it almost kind of carries itself like a bigger bike where it needs to, and then yeah. feels like a little bike where it needs to as yeah. well. Let's, let's stick to climbing, cause I just wanna talk about handling. Mm -hmm. You, we got some tricky climbs here, Kaz. Does this bike feel like a smaller bike? It has less travel, but I mean, some of the angles are pretty slack. It's yeah. longish. I, I, yeah, I really like the climbing on this bike and I think it did feel a little bit quicker than some of the other ones. Okay. Um, the back end's a touch shorter. I think the chainstay length is 435. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit shorter than some of the other ones. The reach is a touch shorter than some of the other bikes too. I do think it helped it wriggle its way through some of the stuff. I think on this bike, I ended up on all the skinny trails somehow. 
no matter what, we we'll dragging up, me along with him, <laughs> kicking and screaming. Yeah. To be honest with you, <laughs> a shout out to the resurgence of Skinnies and Whistler. I'm a huge fan, and somehow they seem to be popping up everywhere. I don't know who's doing it, but good job. But anyways, this bike, I think a Skinny is a good place to test the handling of a bike. <laughs> Go straight and then fall off. I can make little tricky turns. So. <laughs> I think there's good maneuverability to be had there. Kaz, on this morning's ride, I was on the Scott, which is a, a longer bike, 150, mm -hmm. 160. I was watching you, some of those tight uphill switchbacks. You were having a much easier time getting inside on those, where I was always on the outside of those corners, yeah. always just trying to manage the front end on the Scott, where you were easily going inside. Yeah, I think that comes, you know, the shorter travel, a little tinier wheelbase, and just the overall maneuverability with this bike. It does feel like that. I think for aggressive trail bike, that's kind of the name we've, you know, made up for this category. This one feels like an aggressive trail bike to me. Yeah. It's not an all mountain bike. It's not an enduro bike. It's an aggressive trail bike for, you know, you can ride aggressively uphill and downhill, which we'll talk about now. We spent a lot of time riding this bike down some fairly rocky, steep stuff here. Kaz, are you being held back on this bike because it has less travel than some of the others? Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of the nature of how it goes. If you're dropping into something super steep and you have a 140 fork versus a 160, yep. you know, there, there are limits, but I would say it takes a while to hit the limits with this bike. Like we've yeah. like been mentioned a bunch, we've ridden it in the Whistler bike park, probably on some trails you wouldn't normally take a 130 bike <laughs> on. And it's a you know 140 Fox 34 in the front. So it's designed for that type of thing. But there's also a side to this bike that makes you wonder, oh, what if I put a 150 36 on it? Or yeah. like, it's that capable that it wouldn't be out of place to do that to this bike. Uh, yeah, I would usually like, most of the times, Kaz, when you say stuff like that, I'm like, no, don't do that. It's ruining the bike. Mm -hmm. But on this Norco, you can easily get away with a bigger fork on this thing. And it, yeah. yeah, it just makes sense. And honestly, that comes down to the geometry, the geometry of this thing, that Norco's ride line geometry is what they call it with size specific rear ends. Um, it just works really well. Talk to me about how this thing feels when you're going really fast in the bike park. Yeah, I mean, it, there are limits. Again, I, I don't want to make this seem like it's some magical, super smooth magic carpet of a bike, because it is a 130 bike. That said, at higher speeds, it's still not that much of a handful. You know, you can, you can really carve it around. Mm -hmm. it, it sucks up enough of the bumps to feel comfortable. I think compared to something like the Norco Optic, which we've reviewed before, that one has a little bit less travel and definitely a lot firmer feel like that one gives you more feedback where this one it can soak up some of the bigger hits again there's limits but we didn't have any harsh bottom outs or anything yeah. but you are just you're recognizing the limits of a 130 bike especially with big braking bumps and things but that said it's not a bike that feels sketchy either you just kind of realize yeah. like oh i'm going pretty fast and there's not a lot of travel left but you don't feel like concerned for your safety usually geometry suspension travel this is more important geometry is more important and this bike proves it yeah kaz when you were coming down uh, some some rowdy stuff or some fun trails even. Does it feel more playful because it has less travel? Like, did you feel like more active, poppy, jumpy? Like, was not, there more energy? Was there more? I mean, not as much. I'd say that the overall feel, it's not yeah. super rampy. It's not a bike that, you know, I'm trying to think, think of a, off the top of my head, a bike that's like extra rampy and playful. Maybe some of the Santa Cruz bikes tend to feel a little bit more yeah. zip to them. So this isn't like zippy wouldn't be the way I'd describe it, yeah, but it I'd does do. feel calm um, and is also, it's not a lack of support. It just doesn't have that like super poppy feel to it. Just kind of a more neutral, tough feel to its overall ride characteristics. A tough feel would be the yeah. way that I would describe this thing. Yeah, like tough is kind of a weird sensation to put into, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think that's kind of how it feels. Yeah. Just ready for anything in that kind of trail bike world. One thing it's not is a 130 mil bike for like your traditional short travel, 130 mil kind of trail rider. like. This is going to be a lot of bike for somebody who's like in middle America and wants a bike to cover a lot of ground. Unless you want to roll some, some steepish stuff and go fast on some like relatively tricky terrain, I would say that maybe this isn't the bike for you. Yeah, I can see that. I think it could be a great bike for someplace like the East Coast of the US where you do have like a little more punchy ups yeah. and downs. So you don't need tons of travel, but you also want a bike that can Traction, know, active traction, suspension. And then help you out when things do get steep because you can definitely, it has a geometry to handle the steeps. It's just a limit of how hard you can push it. All right, so we've got this $4,000 bike. We've been pitting it against these $11,000 bikes. We should talk about what components you actually get for this price. Standouts? Suspension, Kaz. This bike has great suspension on it. Um, and that's a major factor how this bike performs, obviously. Really adjustable, it works really well, and like we're gonna use that well-rounded phrase a lot, but that's the answer here. The other thing that I really like, those TRP brakes, they feel so good, Kaz. 
yeah, I wasn't as big of a fan of those on this bike. I like the TRPs, but these ones felt a little bit more wooden than some of like the DH Evo, I believe is the version we've ridden a bunch on the, yeah. the longer travel bike. So they did have plenty of power, which is nice. There's a lot of steep rock moves here and enough modulation that I felt okay, but they did feel a little bit kind of like wooden or just kind of like clunky maybe, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I do think they're appropriate. And again, it's nice to see a big rotor up front. And even going back to the suspension, we should mention this is the this is Fox's uh, factory series suspension. So it's actually top of the line. Um, and you do have the grip two damper on the Fox 34, which sometimes you know you don't see that all the time. So yeah. plenty of adjustments, you can really dial the bike in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One other thing to mention too, there's no chain guide on this bike, which is fine. I think some of the other bikes don't have chain guides, um, but it really comes down to how well the chain ring can hold that chain and the clutch and all that stuff. And we did drop the chain a few times. I've lost the chain, I don't know. I mean, I put a lot of miles on this bike, but like two or three times, I think Matt lost the chain once as mm -hmm. well. So yeah, that's worth mentioning. You might want to have a little bolt-on guide there. Yep. And I guess we also should mention while we're on components, the rear hub has developed some play. Yeah. Um, seems like just some bearing play. This bike doesn't have a ton of miles. So it's a little bit early for that there. I think there's house brand Norco hubs. So that's maybe one of the, uh, the weaknesses in the build kit. Kaz, one thing that you mentioned on this bike is that you wanted a longer dropper post. It's 170 mils. Why do you want to like, yeah, that wasn't necessarily, even for more drop, like a 170 was fine on this bike and I yeah. never felt like the seat was in the way, but it has such a short seat tube. Um, and I have you know, moderately long legs, I'd, I'd say, but I ended up with the post extended far enough there was almost at the minimum line. Oh. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to have, with a 200 drop, I wouldn't have had much as much post sticking above the seat tube. Yeah, because this um, is the size you would be on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the right yeah. size for me. This is a size large, 480 reach. That's typically what I'm on. It's a very close to perfect fit, but the 410 seat tube length is fairly short. So it just means you get up, it's tiny. Yeah, That's most, uh, yeah, a lot of times, I think most companies have around 440, it seems yeah. like is where it's settling on. So not a big deal, but if you do look on Norco's chart, uh, it even mentions that they recommend this have a 200 post and it's specced with a 170. So something that, it was my bike, I'd probably put a 200 just to kind of like, alleviate yeah. any of that. It's not, I don't even know to call that a pro or con, but something to keep in mind with this one. We're going to talk about what the clock says next. And Kaz, we spoke about how this bike didn't feel that efficient. How do you think it did in the efficiency test? Was it not so efficient? It finished second, only one second behind the trek. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. How did it do on the downhill portion of time testing? This one ended up being fourth. It's only I think one second, one or two seconds off the top spot. Again, I tend to be fairly consistent with my times no matter what bike, but. Did you feel closer to the edge because I had less travel? Not really, but there's some rougher sections where I probably was carrying a little more speed on some of the longer travel bikes. <laughs> Late season bike park, some rougher <laughs> yeah, sections. Yes, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> rougher might be putting it lightly. So um, I kind of thought it might've done a little better. If, there are some twisty bits where I felt faster on it, but yeah. I think some of those rougher straightaways might've tipped the clock a little bit. Let's talk models next. This bike is $4,000, which I don't think would have seemed like a killer deal, you know, three, four years ago right now. Yeah, this, yeah. this makes sense. But it all starts at $2,700 American, which gets you the same Geo. And I haven't ridden that bike, but I would sure like to try it. I think that one has X-Fusion suspension, uh, same Geo, and it should be ready for action. I'm gonna start with the pros and Great suspension, great geometry. You can get this bike and just go riding. And yeah, it doesn't have some of the features of some of these other way more expensive bikes, but dude, this thing just works damn well. The suspension setup guide that Norco provides for oh, yeah. this is so the best one of all the bikes that we've been reviewing here. Uh, it gives you everything as far as you put in your rider height, weight, and um, kind of your preferred terrain or yep. ability basically. And then it gives you all the things you'd ever need to get this thing up and rolling, including tire pressure, even recommended bar and stem dimensions, and then the shock pressures and everything. Can, so. can you imagine you buy yourself a $2,700 mountain bike, you can go to their website and it tells you everything to do to yeah. get the suspension rolling exactly how it's designed to. I don't think that's the case for some of these really expensive bikes we have. No. Norco's always done a good job with that. And yeah, kudos to them. All right, Kaz, you've got another con or two to add. What are they? Yep. I think one of the cons we've kind of mentioned before, this isn't going to be the bike for somebody that wants that kind of light and lively, full on classic trail bike. Yep. Definitely more skewed toward the aggressive side of things. Um, somebody that wants more technical terrain. You know, the weight is fairly reasonable, but there are lighter bikes out there. And there are also bikes that are a little bit less active when you're climbing. Don't be fooled by it's 130 mils. 
it's definitely made for some, some rowdy terrain. That's where it best suits. Let's wrap this up, Kaz, by talking about what type of rider this best suits. And we kind of just underlined it right there. Someone who likes to pedal, but also likes to ride some things, right? Yeah, it can almost be your Whistler cross country bike. Yeah, exactly. You know, somewhere here where things are pokey and sharp and steep, does great there. Same thing we mentioned the East Coast before, but places with technical riding, but you might not want to, you don't want to lug around your big enduro bike. You want to try something a little bit different. This yeah. is a great aggressive trail bike. Guys, before we get out of here, I have one more question for you. Were you surprised that this $4,000 bike seem to keep up just fine with some of the other bikes? Like, did it, did it feel like it cost less on the trail? I mean, there's a couple little component bits that just didn't feel quite as refined, I'd say, but I don't think it's as, it's not a $7,000 performance difference. Yeah, you know, A $4,000 exactly. bike versus an $11,000 bike, it might feel a little bit slightly, I and mean, even rough around their edges even putting it too strongly. So yeah, I think there yeah, are differences, and you in a blind test, you could notice for some of these other ones, but I think overall, very strong performance and a great price for what you're getting. And obviously these $11,000 ones, they're just not head and shoulders above it. They're like maybe a little bit in Which some cases. Crazy. Yeah, so it's just kind of how things work. Depends where your priorities lie. But yeah. if you're wanting a bike with good geometry, suspension that works well, solid parts kit that doesn't need a ton of upgrading, this is a good place to start. Yeah. All right, that is our review of Norco's brand new Fluid FS1. Tell us what you think about this bike in the comments. Is it too green for you? Is this your kind of trail bike or would you prefer something a little lighter, uh, something maybe meant for a little more pedaling or do you wanna go even more aggressive? Let us know what you think in the comments and we'll see you around for more field test videos real soon.